Hey, welcome back to BrandonVot.com. I'm back here for another great interview. Today, I'm talking with one of my best friends, Matthew Warner. Matt, welcome to the show. What's up, man? Raise the roof. <laughs> I'm excited to bring Matt here because he just published his very first book. It's called Messy and Foolish, How to Make a Mess be a fool and evangelize the world. And we're going to talk a lot a bit, uh, about that book. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Matt. Matt is the founder and CEO of Flocknote. If you haven't heard of Flocknote, run and tell your parish about it now. It's one of the most popular tools for parishes to send emails and text messages and stay connected to their flock. Over a thousand parishes in the country use it. And it's a phenomenal way to harness the, the new media to reach your flock and connect them. Matt is also a popular writer and blogger. You can find him at his website, matthewwarner.me. And he and his wonderful family live in Texas, where they have four children and a fifth on the way. I think I can say that, right? By the time this interview goes live. <laughs> yep, yep. If not, world-breaking announcement. Hopefully your parents <laughs> are watching. <laughs> well, first... Um, uh, before we get into the actual book itself, this book, which was just published by Dynamic Catholic, you can find the book at messyandfoolish.com. And when you go there, Matt's got all sorts of cool stuff. You can sign up for a, a free uh, email course related to the book. You can sign up to get free bonuses once you buy the book. So go to messyandfoolish.com. But this book sort of emerged out of an article that you wrote maybe a couple years ago at the National Catholic Register, an article that really took off and went viral. So tell us about that article. Yeah, you know, it was it was something I wrote really it, it came out of my own experience and frustrations in in trying to share my faith and really from a lot of the mistakes that I made personally um in trying to do that. Um you know, after sort of um realizing what a treasure we had in our Catholic faith and and getting really excited about it, you know, I went through the typical process um, that a lot of people do where they, they become a kind of zealot, um, where they're, they, they're just sharing their faith in every possible way and, and almost sometimes too aggressively or pushing it out there in, in ways that maybe aren't as effective as, as they could be. Um, but I, I also started to work with a lot of institutions in the church through Flocknote and other things like that, um, trying to help solve this big problem we have you know, of, of, of people leaving the church and trying to help my generation realize what they were leaving, you know, and and I realized in that process that a lot of these programs, conferences, resources, all those kinds of things um, would fall flat with most with the average American, you know, that that they wouldn't really resonate with them. They'd resonate with this small percentage of people who are really engaged in the faith, or small percentage of people who you know, had already said, okay, I'm interested in the faith, now teach me. But most of our things were not reaching beyond that to people that were altogether sort of indifferent to the faith and not taking Catholicism seriously in the first place. And so, um, you know, I wrote this article that sort of said, look, we can get all the programs right, we can speak all the truth we want, um, but if we're not living the life we should be, if we're not um, being inspirational in the way that we do it, if we're not being loving, if we're not um, reaching people where they're at, um, then it, it ends up being very ineffective. And so essentially that was this, this article that I wrote that, that really hit a nerve, I think, in, in the Catholic world, um, who I think had similar feelings that I did. So that article sort of laid the groundwork for your new book, Messy and Foolish, which was just published by Dynamic Catholic. And in this book, you start off with an introduction where you lay out the problem, again, explaining essentially why the world doesn't take Catholicism seriously. And then your solution comes in the form of these three parts of your book. The first part is on messes, the second part's on foolishness, and the third part is on evangelizing the world. So I want to talk about each of those three parts. So first of all, messes. Um, what do you mean by make a mess, and why why are messes why why can messes be good things? Good, good question. So first, you know, you look at the statistics of people drifting away from the faith. You know, they're they're staggering. You know, for every one person that joins the church, more than six are drifting out the back door. So you know, we can celebrate and should celebrate the one that, that joins the church as much as we can, but 
but clearly something we're doing isn't working. You know, and so at some point, you know, we have to. Uh, I've heard the analogy of, um, you know, when something's going wrong, uh, shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, and it's like, well, you know, shuffling the chairs around on the Titanic is not going to fix the fact that the Titanic is sinking into the ocean. You know, and um, and so I think we're in a similar situation here, where it's it's that bad. You know, that there's there's such a crisis. And we're doing all these sort of small things. And I think at some point we have to stop and say, no, we need big solutions to big problems. And what it means, I think, in terms of making a mess, and Pope Francis has asked us to do this too, um, but everything we do, whether it's our institutions, how they're structured, the programs we have, our approach to all of them, the leadership, everything should be under scrutiny. And we must be willing to make a mess of any or all of them to the extent that they're not working, you know? And so we can't just do small little tweaks and expect to get big improvements. Um, so I think we have to be ready to, to really make a mess of how we think about sharing the faith with the world. Um, and I think uh, when things aren't working right, making a mess in this case is a good thing. And so first it's realizing that making a mess is productive in a sense. Um, that it's moving us forward towards finding the right solutions. Um, so that's what I mean by a good mess. Um, and we've got to be willing to make those kind of messes for the church, you know. And, I mean, Jesus himself made made big a big mess of things when he came, right? He turned many of our conventions upside down. Um, he turned our pri- priorities totally upside down. Um, his commandments, if we follow them, you know, make a complete mess of our lives and the things we're doing right now and the things that we set as priorities— you know, so these are good messes, and it's part of our faith, I think, to make those kind of messes. Um, and we have to have the courage to make them, you know, not just in the institutional church, in our, in our structures, in our programs, but especially, and in, in first and foremost, in our own lives, in our own hearts. So that's part one of your book, Messy and Foolish, uh, which was just published by Dynamic Catholic. Part one is on making a mess. Part two is on foolishness. You know, I think a lot of people will see this and say, I don't want to be a fool. Like, who would, who would want to be <laughs> foolish? That means being simplistic or stupid. But you suggest that we're called to be fools. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, well, first of all, when you make a mess and rearrange your whole life to order it around this seemingly invisible God, you know, when you, when you love your enemies— when you give up honor and fame and wealth and pleasure and you trade it for hardship and holiness, you know, when you give up a big career to spend a little bit more time with your children, when you give, um, you know, when you give from your needs and not just from your excesses, you know, those kind of things look really foolish to the world, you know, and if there were no God and our faith wasn't true, they would be foolish. And people will look at us and say, you know, what fools, you know, why would you do those things? But it's that question right there that, that helps them begin to see the world differently to say, well, how does all that make sense? How does it make sense that millions, billions of Christians would live such foolish lives, such seemingly foolish lives, unless it was true? You know, and the only way that it makes sense then is when Jesus comes into the picture and you realize now that it all makes perfect sense. But at first, it's a very foolish life according to the world, you know, and we forget that, you know, we're trying to solve this problem and attract people to the faith. A lot of times we're attracted by these sort of big, um, fancy, uh, popular sort of programs or conferences or whatever that, that are going to have a lot of, um, a lot of attention, you know, so they're going to be popular. People are, a lot of people are going to talk about them or it's going to have big crowds show up. Um, or we think that it's our operational personal or our personal greatness that's going to attract people to the faith. So how excellent our lives are or how well we're put together or how, you know, how everything seems to just go so well in our lives or in our, or in our organizations that, that that's what's going to attract people to the faith. Or it's going to be some you know, brilliantly um, you know, written uh, resource or some sort of well-planned talk series that we give on Sundays. And, you know, all those things are good and important and they play, a, they play an important role. But that's not first what I think 
most radically attracts people to the faith. You know, it's not even the sort of brilliance and genius of the faith, even though it has that and it has this pursuit of excellence and truth that is inspiring and attractive. But the first thing I think that attracts people to the faith is seeing people live out their lives radically, to see them sacrifice for it because they go, wait a second, how, why would you give up all of that? How could you love your enemy? How can you treat them with such respect and love and dignity when they've done these such horrible things? That's what all of a sudden, and it's something that the world sees as foolish, but that's what all of a sudden helps them see, okay, maybe there's something to this faith. Maybe there's something to their beliefs. Maybe it's true. And I think, you know, for the faith, when you can view it from the inside, makes beautiful sense. You know, I've heard, I think it was probably Bishop Barron, I think, that gave that visual. I've heard him say, you know, it's like stained glass. When you're, when you're looking at it from the outside of a building, it doesn't really necessarily look that special. But when you come onto the inside and you, and you see it from the inside looking out, you see how beautiful it is. And I think our faith is so much like that. But in order to get them to step in the door in the first place, you know, it's that, it's that foolishness, I think, that attracts people most. And, 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 it, and it, it, hidden within this foolishness is this happiness beyond all we can imagine. If we can just live it out enough to inspire people to give it a try. So that takes us to the last part of your new book, Messy and Foolish. The introduction of the book talks about the problem. Why is the world not taking Catholicism seriously? The first part we talked about looks at messes, how to make a good mess. The second part looks at foolishness. We just talked about that, how to become a fool for Christ, to use Paul's language. But then the third part is on evangelizing the world. Now, at first glance, that's a monumental task. I mean, where do you even begin to evangelize the world? Well, first of all, it is our task. It's our mission as a church to evangelize and to evangelize the world as a whole. So um, it is our mission. It's what we've been tasked with doing. We have a duty to do it. Um, and, you know, so we have to get out of this mindset that we're here to just maintain a great institution or to maintain the status quo. You know, we've been handed this torch by a radical founder, by Jesus, and we're asked to hand that on and to catch the world on fire. So it's it's not just a, something that we're you know we're um, we do if we have time or do if if we feel like it or that some people are called to but others aren't, but that all of us have as a central mission to our lives um, on this planet. So um, you know, but the ordinary way this happens though is not through big huge things. You don't have to make huge impacts. It's through doing small simple things, and 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 it is a very simple thing to do. But it is also very hard, and I think that's why I think we, so many of us, I think, I know myself included, fall short so often. Um, but there's certainly nothing to be intimidated about the task, because God, of course, has given us everything we need to do exactly what he's asking us to do. So in whatever way God is asking you to evangelize, God's given you everything you need to do it. Um, but I think, sort of, my, where my heart was a lot with this book, it, because I was so focused on big programs or big answers or big solutions that I was quick to look past the simple solutions that I think if each of us did, the world would be evangelized, you know, and I, it, we, we too often get focused on feeding a thousand people. Look at all these hungry people. How do we feed so many people? But if one, if each of us just went out and fed one, they would all be fed, you know? And, and, and so I think it's the same with sharing the faith. Um, that, you know, too often we get attracted to these big solutions. We look right past the simplest ones. We're, we're too busy loving random strangers across the globe um, or loving our neighborhood that we forget to love our neighbor. You know, we look right past the poor soul living right next door or living at our own home even um, because, you know, they're, they're harder. They're more inconvenient. It means we have to mess up our lives more to try to serve them and accommodate them. And so it, it really does come down to these small things and the simple commandments that, that Jesus gave us to love God and to love your neighbor. But too often, I know this was my, was my fault um, in, in approaching this, is that I, I don't think I took those that seriously. They seem so simple. Love God, love your neighbor. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. But was I really doing that each day? And when it came to loving my neighbor, you know, loving your neighbor is not just you know, sort of treating them the way you want to be treated. 
You know, loving your neighbor is taking on their problems as your own. You know, loving them as yourself. You know, that means if they have a problem, it's now your problem. It's now you take a responsibility to help solve that problem. Well, that's that's hard. That's inconvenient. That means I don't have time to do all the hobbies I want to do. It means I have to break my schedule every once in a while because they need something. And it seems so inconvenient. It seems so disruptive. It seems so foolish to live that way. But yet, if each of us did that, these simple things God asked us to do, that Jesus gave us in these simple commandments, I think we would be amazed at the impact it would have in, in, in terms of evangelizing the world. Well said. Now I want to encourage everybody to go pick up Matt's new book, Messy and Foolish. You can find it at messyandfoolish.com. It's short, it's punchy, it's very inspiring. Uh, you'll finish it ready to, to evangelize the world, as the subtitle suggests. Uh-huh. So go to messyandfoolish.com. When you go there, Matt's got all sorts of cool free stuff. You could sign up for the Messy and Foolish Challenge. You can download some great video interviews with other people who are trying to put this stuff into practice. Uh, you can get a study guide for the book as well. So go to messyandfoolish.com and make sure to get all that free stuff when you pick up your copy of the book. So Matt, thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you in the next video interview here at brandonvot.com. Thanks so much, Brandon.